last week on a life sentence. I sat in a living room with her and she was just crying. I said, well, what happened? And then she said, um, he's dead, he's freaking dead. She said, hey. I did not want to do I stabbed him and beat him up. A lot of regrets that I should have made them stay home, you know. I blame myself. Yeah. I didn't do it. I didn't kill him. But I should have made them stay home. I was. I always say I should have told them to made them stay home. This is the courthouse where it took place. Yeah, it is. It is really odd. But you know, I, I still remember it from, and I even remember now, like being here 27 years ago, when I was in here. I remember it plain as day. Jay Cook sits in a Yorkton, Saskatchewan courtroom. It's summer 2020. The prosecution was on that side, and Odelia and Nurse, I think, were right here because there was two of them, so there couldn't have been just the one, like. I'm sure that's how it was. He sat through every day of his partner Odelia Cusance's trial, listening to the horrific details of Joe Dolph's murder. It was hard, really hard. There was lo a lot of violence in the case. I believe she didn't do it. I I've seen her at her worst and I've seen her at her best. and. She just wasn't that kind of person. She wouldn't do something like that. After the verdict was read, a lot of the people in here were like, just couldn't believe it, you know? And like a lot of her family that was here. I think she looked more scared than anything. Odelia remembers that verdict like it was yesterday. I thought my life was over. I would never, ever get out of prison. And I also told Jay, oh, I'm never getting out. You might as well move on. But Jay has stood by her. Well, it's important for me to uncover what really happened. I got it when I was like three months old. My kids need their mother. I mean, like we have twin girls that are 13 years old now and they need to be with their mother and have guidance from their mother. Like I wouldn't guess that that was me when I was a kid. Daughter Haley grew up behind bars with her mom until she was two. I grew up with my mom in the system, you know, going from healing lodges to correctional facilities and whatnot. And so I grew up in the environment at the healing lodge um, where she was allowed to have me there and kind of be able to be my mom while she was still doing her like time. She's now 21. There was a situation that happened that she was um, there for, like she was in the vicinity of and um, while it happened, she was kind of um, like put into the pile of people that caused this situation to happen. Um, I don't like going too deep into detail about it, um, just because I do get emotional, but um, so I will just call it the situation. But 
um, I do know that that's kind of the story that I've always been told. Yeah, she I got and that like picture school. somewhere. Of what? Of the dog oh. walking around with you at your feet. Yeah. She seemed sleepy and like I didn't want a jumpy dog. Yeah. And then we got home and she was just so hyper. All these years, I was with the mother. Yeah. And I was with the mother. All my kids every day, twice a day. You know what? My kids still love me. Too. We still have that deep bond. My kids are safe today. And I have a wonderful partner today. Take good care of our kids. And he believes in me. And he's been by my side too. Forever. I met him 30 years ago and we've been together 24 years. Stuff on my side, I'm so freaking grateful for him. You no, know, he believes in me. He took care of our daughters. And I honestly believe I broke that cycle with my daughters. Jay still believes there was a miscarriage of justice, and he's been talking to anyone who will listen. It was very comforting to have my mother there. Including prisoner advocate David Milgard. I was wrongfully convicted for a crime that took place in uh, Saskatoon, and I spent almost 23 years in prison. Uh, my mother fought everybody and anybody to, uh, to eventually get me out. The first day of freedom for David Milgard after spending more than 22 years behind bars for a crime he didn't commit. Milgard is perhaps Canada's best known wrongful conviction case. Well, I'm willing to stand up and say there's something wrong. Uh, there's no reason why the, the Attorney General can't make some sort of move to see that she you know, is freed so that she can go home because that's where she needs to be. She has been incarcerated for, I believe, 27 years now. That's even more than I was incarcerated. He believes Odelia and her sister Nerissa should be set free. Her then 15-year-old cousin Jason Cashane had already admitted to the crime. Uh, you have a confession of a person that was responsible for committing the crime. I don't think we really need to look beyond that. He called on private investigator Jolene Johnson to help gather evidence. My name is Jolene and I am a licensed private investigator in the province of British Columbia. She's been a private eye for decades. She was skeptical at first. But I was still on the fence as to whether she was guilty. I had no idea. She looked for important context that the court may have missed. There was reasonable doubt in this all over the place. And nobody, nobody vouched for these girls. Why? You know, and I think nobody did because they're First Nations. I strongly believe that this was a miscarriage of justice. I believe that it was easy for them. These girls were from a reserve. This victim lived outside the reserve and he was white. How can you not state that racism doesn't play a factor in this? It does. Not one single person on that jury panel was, was, um, was First Nations, was Indigenous. Rural Saskatchewan has always simmered with racial tension. But in the 1990s, that turned deadly. Three white men were killed by Indigenous people within 24 months of Dolph's murder. Oran McElry, a scrap business owner, beaten and stabbed by three indigenous hitchhikers. William Dove, 73, he stopped to help a group of indigenous men change a tire. And farmer John Sorgensen, 41, beaten to death in September, 1992. From what I recall of that case, John Sorgensen was uh, fairly, very uh, much a, a much loved part of the community, a, a, a guy who would help uh, help his neighbors, and you know it was a very unfortunate outcome. But um, yeah, I, I think there was I think there was an appetite for you know a pound of flesh on that one. Author Warren Goulding was a crime reporter back then. After the murder of Joe Dolph, there was a public outcry. The sentencing never seems to please anybody because they, uh, they are sentenced as young offenders and not adults, which dramatically changes the, uh, the penalties. 
Robert Johnson, that's an important point. The police, the Crown Prosecutor, they really just wanted to nail, in my opinion, an adult for this crime. That's the way I see it. There was other cases, there were other murders prior to this particular case where there was there was um, allegations of of um, of Satanism and worshiping and all of this stuff in it. Satanism? It's a strange aspect to this case that can be found in the court documents. The police also asked Odelia's sister, Zerlina, if she was a devil worshiper. We were in, involved in the traditional ways. We went to Sundance, rain dances all our lives. We danced, we participated in the ceremonies that went on in our family. They hold quite a few ceremonies within our family. So that's how we were raised. We were not raised to worship something evil. For them, the police asking me about it was very um, offensive. It just seems uh, just over the top, what they're experiencing. James Lockyer is a criminal lawyer and founder of Innocence Canada. He's now representing the sisters. And there's really no doubt at all in my mind that uh, uh, the fact that they're Indigenous has counted against them, counted against them at trial, counted against them when they were uh, with the pol in the police custody, has counted against them throughout their their time in the penitentiary uh, and will continue to do so. So it's, they're, 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 I think I can help them. But how? That's coming up after the break. Jay Cook and his daughter Haley look over family photos in their Saskatchewan home. Look, I have a double chin. <laughs> I didn't know babies could have He and Adelia Cusance have been together for decades. He shuttles their girls across the country for visits. I try and go at least every two months to take the girls to see their mother. Well, they deserve it. He says he never believed Odelia was capable of murder. What we've learned is, you know, there's a lot of evidence that was in there that I, I, I don't know really how they even convicted her. There are a lot of other murders that happened just before theirs and I think they wanted something done with it and to me it just seems like they used the two girls as scapegoats. And they both have always known there's something wrong with her conviction. She thought she did a bunch of stuff but when you, if you read the transcripts of the trial, they weren't true. I personally I think it was the when they were interior interrogating her they would drill it into her head that she did this and after a while they say you believe it. I honestly believe that I should never been charged for second degree. All these years I found it in my heart that this was too much of a, a long sentence and I was just uh a young lady that didn't know. Haley didn't know that much about her mom's crime. And I don't like to think about that too much, just because, like, to me, that doesn't matter. That's my mom. And I'd rather just think about her as my mom rather than her past and the situation that did happen. Jay reached out to Senator Kim Pate for her help. Well, I've known... Uh, Odelia and her sister since they entered the system. The senator is a justice system expert. According to Odelia, she was defending herself and her sister from Dolph's sexual advances. I, I, I kind of got mad because I, I've been watch, protecting my sisters all my life. And I think I finally just, you know, 
my phone, leave my sister alone, not to bother her. And then that's when this all broke out and the stuff happened. Perpate, that fits the pattern she's seen in female killers, most serving life sentences. 91% have histories of abuse that's reported, uh, have histories where they have um, responded to violence, sometimes using violence themselves to defend or react to violence, uh, that that disproportionately gets characterized as more violent often even than men who commit the same or engage in the same behavior. And of course, that's the situation uh, as as far as I know, and as uh, most of us understand, happened with Odelia and Nerissa when um, their cousin was seen as the primary uh, player in this, in terms of uh, and the death. They did everything. They, they stabbed him and beat him up. Jason Cushane admitted he lied back then. But he confessed when we tracked him down on Kisaku's First Nation. First few times I didn't say for it, uh, I lied. I said I wasn't there and stuff like that, you know. The second time I said I was I was there, but I left before everything happened. And the third time I said I I fessed up to what I did. Well, as a kid, you're scared and stuff like that. You're worried and what's going to happen. And... Lawyer James Lockyer says the fact that Jason Cushane admitted to the murder is significant, and it could help the girl's case. Uh, he uh, uh, took it on himself to to stab Mr. Dolph uh, many times and kill him. And because he was only 15 at the time, uh, he got what you could really call a very light sentence. Uh, the two girls who really didn't play a very large role in what happened to Mr. Dolph um, got convicted of murder and served life sentences. He points out that the women were held for days at the RCMP detachment where police obtained statements without their lawyer present. They were held for some three or four days at the police station which kind of sounds like, uh, you know, the deep south in the United States. You read that sort of thing in a Grisham novel uh, uh, that, that reflects the state of the legal system in a place like Alabama in, in the 1980s. Um, it was pretty horrific. Uh, in particular, uh, they made no attempt to tape record them uh, that night, record them in any manner, video or tape. Uh, so we don't see their condition uh, when they're arrested the following morning. And we don't see them say what the police say they said to them uh, after they were arrested. So everything went wrong there too. Both sisters appealed their convictions in the Saskatchewan Court of Appeal in 1994. That appeal was heard and dismissed in 1995. The following month, the sisters appealed again this time to the Supreme Court of Canada, and once again, it was dismissed. Parole violations have kept Odelia in jail, and now Nerissa is unlawfully at large. Her friend Jason Stewart spoke to us on her behalf. If she didn't tell me anything, I would never have guessed her to be going up against something like this because I mean, I've watched her give her last bit of money to somebody on the street that she doesn't even know. She's amazing, she's a good person, I know that for sure. Oh, she misses her family a lot, she tells me. There is a path to freedom for Odelia and her sister. Here's James Lockyer. I feel uh, we can uh, approach the Minister of Justice in Ottawa and ask him to, the Minister is uh, Minister Lametti, ask him uh, to, uh, uh, to change their convictions and change their sentences. And that's the remedy that uh, we would uh, hope for. Federal Minister of Justice David Lametti's office wouldn't comment on this specific case, but Lockyer says he's hopeful. You put all the troubles together and you ultimately come down to a, what's to me is, 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 a, uh, is a pretty clear case of, of manslaughter and, uh, and to me as well, obviously not a case of murder. And Adelia and her family keep waiting and hoping. Like I say, we need resolution. She needs to come home. 
Haley says she doesn't see Odelia's side of the family much. I still talk to most of my aunts, and like I talk to my cousins as much as I can, but growing up there definitely was that wedge where I didn't have the connection because my mom wasn't there to make the connection. And Odelia's sister, Zerlina, echoes that. They missed out on so much, everything that happened in this home, in this yard, you know? All the birthday parties and Christmases that we all shared with the family and get-togethers. And we missed them. We always said, oh, Odelia and Russ should have been here. The sisters, I always said, should have been here. So it's really had a big impact on our lives, big impact. It hurt me a lot, you know. We reached out to the lawyers involved in this case, as well as the judge, but nobody would comment. Throughout it all, Adelia still has a lot of empathy for Dolph and his family. I continue to pray for, for him and his family. I, I, I apologize for what has happened to him. I still continue to pray for him and his family. Nobody deserves to die like that. But I didn't kill him. Like, I can't call him up and tell him my problems, like I can't laugh with them. I'll never hear their laugh again. I'll never be able to hug them again. All of that's been taken from me. We have to ask ourselves, um, are our children not of value? Canada is underfunding of First Nations child welfare is well known, but it's not only the federal government that's failing Indigenous children. First Nations child welfare agencies are assuming more and more responsibility over child welfare each year, and the numbers tell us they are repeating the same mistakes with the same deadly consequences. APTN Investigates brings you the story of four sisters lost to a system meant to keep them safe. People needed to know, like, what happened to my sisters. <laughs>